Hello and welcome to Susie's Book Bag, hosted by me, Susie Fay. I've got a foils book bag up there and the thing I want to draw your attention to is music. We're going to be talking music, hardcore heavy music for the next hour or so um, with somebody who knows far more about the subject than I do, even though I was once um, a music critic. Weirdly enough, I actually started out being a music critic uh, for a local paper in Leeds that that needed one. So I said, I'll, I'll do it. And <laughs> on the principle of just just say yes, go ahead, you know, you'll figure it out. Uh, I never figured it out as well as the person I'm going to be talking to for the next hour or so. It is the very wonderful Simon Price, who is a former colleague of mine at The Independent on Sunday. I'm going to invite Simon into the book bag right now. Hello. Hello. Hello, Susie. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Excellent. And you're, you're coming at us from Brighton, I believe. I am. My spiritual home and now my actual home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll go into all of that uh, in due course. I mean, a great place for for gigging, I guess. Yeah, there's a really strong music scene here. That's one of the things that drew me to it when I when I left London. I thought I can't just pitch up in the middle of nowhere. It's got to be somewhere with a bit of cultural life, and you know, Brighton has loads. So yeah. Perfect. Um, so I have got. Uh, I've got m my hair as big as I can make it. And I have got my <laughs> splash of red lipstick. I see what you've done there. Okay, yeah. I can see where this is going. <laughs> but I haven't quite, I mean, I haven't gone over the lip line and I haven't kind of extended it. No, you sort of got to smear it across, yeah, for the, for the proper. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we will be talking about, well, you know, your, uh, you've written a great book about the Manic Street Preachers, which I absolutely loved back in the day, but we're talking about your new book. I have it here. A whopper in in so many different ways in all ways. It is so here we huge. have your brilliant <laughs> Curepedia A to Z of the Cure, and you know iconic silhouette on the cover. Mm -hmm. This man, this extraordinary man. Um. Anyway, one of the funny things about this this book is I am actually in it. I don't yeah. think <laughs> I don't think I've interviewed anybody where I've actually been in the book um and i'm i'm on page seven i noticed like and and sort of there we go uh this is from back in the day i interviewed um robert smith um and it was a wonderful experience but we'll we'll get on to that and um, yeah. before we get to the cure i just wanted to ask you a little bit about how you became a music journalist a music reviewer um have you ever been in a band or what's what's the first kind of thing where you thought music music that's that's what I want to concentrate on yeah um I suppose it's the cliche of coming from a musical family to some extent um on my mum's side my my grandmother was a fantastic pianist and she never learnt to read music I think this is quite a, a Welsh thing actually that mm. you know your nan can play the piano nobody quite knows how no one knows how she figured it out but she just did um and uh on on my dad's side well uh my dad when I was about 13 um became a DJ on the local radio station in Cardiff but he'd been a massive music fan all his life he was a sort of rock and roller in the 50s and a hippie in the 60s and by the time the 70s came along even though he was too old for it he really got into the whole punk movement and all of that so uh, I mean his his record collection was you know it should have been it should have been sort of set up as a, as a museum after his death you know it really it was really extraordinary but I've I've inherited a lot of that that love and knowledge of, of music from him as well as the the record collection you see behind me, quite a lot of it is, you know, the sort of musical DNA. It's it's stuff that I inherited from from his his collection. So I, I almost didn't have much choice in the matter. If, if I wanted to be really rebellious, I'd have said, no, I hate music. You know, mm -hmm. that, that would have been the thing to do. But um, I, I think my actual origin story as a journalist is similar to yours in, in that I did write for the local paper um, in Barry, where I'm from. And... Um, I was still at school at the time and it was kind of by accident um, because 
we just had one local paper in the town, the Barry and District News. It was a broadsheet. It looked like the Telegraph. It was very old fashioned. Um, and there was nothing in it of interest for young people. Um, so I wrote them a letter complaining about this and, and saying that their paper was just full of um, Lady Skittles results and obituaries, <laughs> which, you know, was a bit harsh, but kind of true. And um, they actually took this to be some kind of job application on my part. And they, I was only 16 and they, they, they wrote back to me and said, well, you know, if you think you can do better, come and write for us. So um, for the two years that I was in the sixth form, uh, Barry Boys Comprehensive, I was uh, writing a weekly column called Simon Says, which was their their dreadful name, not mine. Just yeah. sort of reviewing the the week's singles and just sort of thoughts about music. Um, and I very much got a taste for the kind of very localized notoriety that that can get you. You know, angry letters mm. to the paper saying, "How dare you say the Smiths are more important than the Beatles or, or whatever it was." You know. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, by, by the time I pitched up in London, um, I was kind of already sort of fully formed as, as a writer, a bit precocious in that sense. And, and, and I got involved in the student paper, um, which was I, I studied French and philosophy at, at UCL. And I don't know if you know the layout of Bloomsbury particularly well. I'm sure you do being a book person, but mm -hmm. uh, just down the road from UCL, uh, in fact, opposite the shop that used to be. Dylan's, I don't know what it is now, the bookshop, um, was Yulu, the University of London Union. And mm. um, they ran a paper out of the basement called London Student. And uh, I got involved in writing about music for them and became the music editor. And I thought, is there some kind of sneaky way I can parlay this into writing for proper papers? And we decided to do a sort of behind the scenes in the music business um, feature where people would interview managers, promoters, DJs, agents, all that kind of stuff. And I, I decided to interview my favourite journalist, who was Simon Reynolds of Melody Maker. Got some props with me. This is Simon Reynolds' Bring the Noise, a fantastic right. uh, compendium of his work. But yeah, he was he was my favourite writer. He sort of wrote in a very analytical, intellectual way about about rock, and uh, that was my excuse to get my foot in the door and to, and to get to meet him and and. Uh, when I told him that I was going away to France for a year to study French uh, in Paris, he said, well, why don't you send reviews in to Melody Maker? And, uh, and I, I did. I, I think possibly he or his colleagues might have just said that to get rid of me, thinking, oh, well, just send him off with that. But I took them at their words, and I, I, send reviews, I sent reviews in. Um, you must know the shop Shakespeare & Co. in Paris. Mm, yeah. Yeah, um, I used to go there. Um, they had rickety typewriters that anyone could go in and, and use in the upstairs room. And I would blag myself onto guest lists um, for gigs in Paris and then go and review them upstairs at Shakespeare & Co. and post these reviews to Melody Maker. And they ignored the first few. But then um, finally, November 88, um, they, they printed one, which was Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds at Elysee Montmartre. And um, and I, I I was off then. I was away. I, I still had a year of uni left to do. But I think my head was turned. I I, I wasn't really – my head wasn't in my studies anymore. It, it was, uh, you know, I I, uh, I I knew which way I was going to go. And by the time my, my degree ended, I was already doing quite a lot as a sort of junior – um, reviewer at, at Melody Maker and just sort of carried on from there. Mm. That, was, that was a very long answer to a very short question, but no, no, that's, that's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> was a, um, yeah, I mean, I, I did something similar in writing for Leeds Student, uh, yeah. and I thought I would get into books and theatre. So the, the music thing um, was very accidental, but uh, it was a great time for music in Leeds, and I, I got the coveted uh ents pass uh plus one i mean my my kind of middle name was sort of plus one plus yeah, one uh, yeah <laughs> always had a, a music mad boyfriend in tow um and it's it's kind of a great thing i mean the the feedback 
is interesting. I used to write under initials, so uh -huh. nobody could sort of see. I was I was gender fluid before that was even a thing. <laughs> nobody could really figure out whether this was a young person, old person, a boy or a girl. So right. that, people couldn't. <laughs> I seem to respond equally enthusiastically to sort of male front men and, and female front women kind of thing so nobody yeah. could really figure me out what, um, what era of music was it at least what, what sort of well i i also about? reviewed the smiths uh yeah. when they were you know very uh, like who is this guy with the gladioli um mm -hmm. i remember sisters of mercy were starting right. out and i just i thought oh they're dreadful dreadful can't stand them and then they did really well so yeah um i, I mean the thing about it was to write something for a paper whose readers would not necessarily be going to gigs and buying records themselves but they just wanted to know what was going on you know so it was quite an early I, I think Melody Maker is different you're writing for music you know real sort of musos and aficionados but I was yeah. sort of writing an entertaining piece every week about a weird guy who jumped up on stage with a load of gladioli you know <laughs> had a high voice kind of yeah. thing <laughs> yeah yeah but it's you know it's an it's enjoyable it's enjoyable um so you went to the indie on sunday i mean that's where i came across your writing which i always really really loved i never you. you know i was on the book's desk so i never kind of subbed your stuff or anything like that yeah um but i used to love reading your reviews and um and then you, you know, you wrote the book on the Mannix, which I thought was a really fabulous book. Um, Thank you. I mean, you had, you know, you had you had the Welsh background. I mean, did did Mannix mean something profound to you growing up because of that? Do you think? Well, we're the same age, and we're from more or less the same place. They're from the valleys. I'm from the coast, but only about sort of twenty miles apart. Um, and. Yeah, I think when I started off at Melody Maker, I was writing about just whatever was around at the time. So it was a time of shoegaze music and grunge and um, a little bit of the tail end of Mads Chester, Baggy and all of that. Just sort of, I was casting around looking for the thing that was my thing. And then in 91, this band come along and they're, they're sort of dressing in leopard print coats and wearing makeup, but spouting this kind of Marxist polemic. And... Um, really sort of kicking over the statues and really want really wanting to annoy everybody you know mm. they were they were um picking fights with sacred cows all over the place um and that really 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 appealed to me i thought god they're, they're just like me and i remember i was quite far down the pecking order at melody maker at the time so um plenty of other writers got to interview them before before i did um because that's the other thing that the, the manix very much punched above their weight in terms of press coverage because they um were such great copy because mm -hmm. th those genres that i just mentioned grunge shoegaze baggy that the bands tended to be fairly monosyllabic really and not have a lot to say for themselves except oh well you know we like to let our music do the talking and if anyone else likes it it's a bonus and all that kind of crap you know <laughs> or, or it was all be sort of um, drug related about you know obliterating yourself and getting out of your head and the manics were just the absolute antidote to all of that so they were i once, once I had the chance, I sort of leapt on board. Um, I remember seeing them in Manchester in uh, the spring of 91 and, and got to meet them. And, and obviously we got on like a house on fire because we're, we're from very similar backgrounds. And and uh, um, I, I just loved the way that they were showing a, a best case scenario for for what working class people from Wales could, could be because they were... I was going to say self-taught, you know, they were to some extent they're autodidacts, but they did go to university. So they went through the traditional education system in some ways that they're like me in that they were the one of the last years of students who got the full grant before Thatcher took it all away, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so people from our kind of background could get a, a proper university education for nothing, for absolutely mm -hmm. free. Um so they were fiercely intelligent, very well read, um, and they they weren't ashamed of showing it. You know, there there were quotes f 
from their favorite authors and philosophers all over their record sleeves. And, and um, that, that was actually a bit of a throwback to the Smiths. I mean, we've mentioned the Smiths already and they, they were a life changing band for me. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a shame what Morrissey later became, but, uh, but, but back in the eighties, um, I, I was one of those, I was, I was that Smiths fan who thought that only I understood Morrissey and only Morrissey understood me and all of that. <laughs> um, but but one thing I loved about the Smiths and about certain other bands like Dexys Midnight Runners and the Style Council was that if you're a fan of those bands, it was an education in itself. They they would point you in the, in the direction of, of, um, of art, of philosophy, of authors and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, the the Manics to me were a sort of throwback to, to to that type of band again. And then Suede came along the following year in '92, um, who were also very glamorous and also very intelligent. And those two bands were were, were the two that I I really kind of um, st stuck my flag in, as it were, and 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 rallied behind and and tried to really advocate for via Melody Maker. And and they they seem to be a sort of cause to to believe in, and even more so when the mid nineties came along, and you had all these sort of lad rock bands like Oasis, mm -hmm. who were um, proudly anti intellectual, mm -hmm. and and what what really annoyed me was that um, middle class Southern English journalists patronizingly. Um, encouraged and applauded the Gallagher brothers for, for being that way and try to portray them as being the authentic, true voice of, of the working class. And I was thinking, well, hang on a minute. No, you know, I come from South Wales. The Mannix come from South Wales, come from working class backgrounds. Um, and we're, we're, we're proud to, to, to be clever and to be artistic and, and to have ideas about things. But that didn't fit the kind of stereotypical template that that the media what wanted to, to to use, so um, it it became quite polarized. You know, I I, I was um, I felt that, that those bands really represented one side of a struggle. Um, I would put Jarvis Cocker of Pulp in that category as well, actually, mm -hmm. of, of uh, somebody who was from a working class background and highly intelligent and not ashamed of showing it, and not ashamed of being different, not ashamed of difference. You know. Um, the, 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 this idea that um, working class people had to had to be all about cigarettes and alcohol, lager, 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 and all that all that mm. bollocks, you know, um, re really annoyed me. And I thought it was so important that the Manic's biggest single, um, when they when they came mm. back after Richie Edwards's disappearance, began Everything with the words, um, "Well, the album Everything Must Go," and the single. A design for life. Uh, design began, for life. Yeah. Uh, it began with the words "libraries gave us power," mm. and that's such an important thing for a rock band, a working class rock band, to sing a song that says "libraries gave us power." At the same time that bands like Oasis are saying, "Well, I've never read a book. I'm proud of never having read a book." You know. So um, yeah, I, I, I think the Mannix were one of those bands who were that their, their, their cultural importance went beyond rock and roll it, they, they it's 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 interesting how many people i've i've since met who have who were manix fans and have gone on to become teachers manic street teachers you know it's it's an actual thing um and because you know they they, they want to kind of pass on that that education that, that the that manix gave them so mm -hmm. um yeah i mean music music to me is never just about the music it's never mm. oh it's, it's just just the songs man no it's it, there's always so much going on in in pop mm. than just the notes and the singing that it's it's a whole a whole kind of theater really um it's... they're still amazing i mean they did uh, i think i think they did a set at glastonbury last year which i only saw on the telly um and it was quite frustrating uh because uh the the way it was filmed was it was like somebody who didn't really understand the music or the band was was filming it so it's just like well there's the singer we'll put the camera on him and we'll very occasionally pull back and you're just sort of thinking oh my god everyone in the world wants to see nicky wire you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And yeah. you would just see this loping figure very occasionally and sort of go oh you know if only 
you know, somebody who didn't understand the band dynamic there. Um, but would you say as a young um rock writer that was immensely helpful for you if you've identified two bands that are on the up that so you then become almost you know not a spokesperson but you know you know what i mean you become more prominent yeah. as a writer yeah yeah um it, it definitely does help um it's basically the plot of the film almost famous isn't it if you've seen that mm. film you know, yeah yeah is, uh, yeah that's cameron yeah. crow uh, rolling stone yeah. journalist yeah yeah um yeah. really good film um well, I mean, those. We'll we'll go on to talking about the cure, I think, because the, that discussion has given us a few inroads. Um, mm. I came up. There's a quote um, that I picked out from the book that I thought was interesting. I think it's from right at the beginning where you're talking about why the cure, and and you said there's something going on behind the sound itself. Mm -hmm. And that really resonated with me. I mean, in terms of books or films, especially films, and the way I say it is um, it's it's not about what it's about. You know, there's a kind of yeah. surface, but you just mm. feel that there's so much, there's things moving around behind the sound or behind the words or behind the images that, that somehow you tap into. Yeah, perhaps the difference between the cure and some of those other bands I mentioned, like the Smiths and the Mannix, is that there is a certain amount of mystique around the cure and a certain amount of decoding mm. is necessary. Mm. Whereas the Smiths, it was, you know, they just completely laid it on the line. They are saying what they are saying and you didn't really have to decode it. Mm. Um, but the cure are definitely one of those bands who are an education and there is so much life of the mind going on in there that they're so culturally rich. And, and this is something that I discovered more and more when I was researching the book. Um, in fact, I've, I've even given talks purely about the literary influence on, on The Cure, um, which is huge. And that some of them are really well known. So, for example, Killing an Arab, mm -hmm. their first single is based on Le Tranger, The Outsider by, by Camus. Um, but there, there are others. I mean, sh the song Charlotte Sometimes is about the children's novel. Charlotte mm. sometimes um uh a lot of their album faith is um is to do with Mervyn Peake's Gorman Gas trilogy um a lot of uh books about psychology um that Robert had been reading um fed into the album pornography so he'd been reading a lot of RD Lang and stuff like that um he's a big fan of Dylan Thomas uh of Baudelaire and uh um, oh, there was a, a J.D. Salinger short story which in, influenced the song Banana Fish Bones on, on the album The Top. There's just so much. Once you start digging, it's it's, it's almost endless. So he's obviously very well read. And um, and, and uh, his love of literature and poetry in, inspired him. And I think it's it's lovely to know if you know that stuff, but you kind of don't have to know it. Uh, you almost don't have to speak English to understand the cure. This this is another thing. I, I think this is it, it goes some way to explaining their kind of global success, is that you only have to look at the face of Robert Smith or to hear the timbre of his voice and the kind of elegiac nature of their chord changes and melodies to know what they're trying to convey emotionally. You you, you know what the cure are putting across, even if you're not English. Um which, which I, th I think is, is is really important in terms of why they are so huge in places like Mexico, for example, uh, or, or Brazil. Mm. So it's it's an A to Z, um, yeah. and like, you can actually play quite a fun game with it. Which <laughs> um, so each it does go from A to Z, and you've you've got all these fascinating entries, and then there are within each entry there are words in bold that send you off somewhere. So. You can kind of leapfrog your way through. This is not a book that you start at A and you go all the way yeah. through to Z. Some people have, which I find weird, but that's it's up to them what they do with it. But yeah, that's cool, <laughs> fans, I guess. Yeah. Um, so um, if you start starting at A, if you if you start at arrests, you could then yeah. move quite quickly to pissing, <laughs> um, and then you could leap leap backwards to Generation X. 
and then yeah. you leap to Lowell Tolhurst. And actually, many, many roads lead to Lowell Tolhurst, Indeed. I, I noticed, as, as you would expect um, while I was doing this. Then, um, So, again, alcohol. You could then go to Susie. Then you could then go to Dear Prudence. Then Tim Pope. Um, and then whiz back to Bowie. So you kind of hop around. Um, and I, I like this one. A forest. Gothic. New Order, Drugs, Mary, <laughs> and so on and so on and so on. But yeah. um, if we could just take, well, let's take goth. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I mean, that's such a contested term. And I've, mm. I've interviewed Kathy Unsworth and her season. Oh, yeah. She was a colleague of mine at Melody Maker. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's uh, tremendously good fun. But even in that book, she is really wrestling with the idea of what how can we even define goth mm. um a cure goth well um they have often strenuous strenuously denied being goth but in a way that's how you spot a goth they'll deny oh. it you know it's it's kind of like the the witch's ducking stool you know that if, oh, if they yeah. deny being a witch you know you, you 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 test them by ducking them and if they survive well they're a witch burn them um <laughs> that's witchcraft and if they if they drown well they're dead and so yeah it's it's the same it's the same logic with with goths you know if 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 they identify as one they are one if they don't they probably are one you know um <laughs> i i think certainly uh, some of their early albums 17 seconds faith pornography were um hugely influential on what became the goth sound um and obviously robert's look and simon gallup as well the bassist their, their hair and, and the makeup um along with susie sue i guess being the female version defined the 80s goth image mm. so and Robert, Robert used to go to the Batcave Club with Steve Severin from the Banshees, you know, so he, he can deny it all he likes, really. Um, <laughs> whether the Cure want to be known as a goth band or not doesn't really matter because goths tended to love them, except for the type of goth who was really hardcore and thought the Cure were a soft option. There was that. And I was a little mm -hmm. bit that way myself for a while. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, of course, of course, the Cure are either, either proto-goth or goth adjacent or, or just plain old goth yeah yeah or well, maybe they kicked it off i think if you kick something off or help kick something off you can't entirely be defined by the thing that comes after if you see what i mean you know it's true yeah um there are and, strands and I, aren't there there are goth strands um yeah and and um by the time goth became really huge in the late 80s uh, when the sisters got big and mm. the cult and the mission and all of that mm. the, the cure had kind of become a pop group at by, mm. by that point which is something i love about them by the way that the fact that they, they weren't just this kind of monochrome doomy miserable band that they they did write fantastic pop tunes um because nobody's miserable all the time not even goths you know um <laughs> so um yeah i i i think um possibly the fact that they were very early on in in the development of goth means that they get a free pass to say well you know goth was copying us rather than them yeah. being of of it yeah yeah mm. for sure and there's a lot about the banshees and mm. susie and uh steve severin i mean um i mean almost as as if it's a book about them as well i mean i kept finding references and obviously robert played with the banshees and the reason that i'm on page seven the inter the interview that i did um with uh robert smith he he yeah. did talk about susie in in very interesting hmm. in very interesting terms so um yeah how, uh, i mean how do you how do you decide how much to go into something or did you just think I am gonna I'm gonna go and go and go until I hit some kind of a wall and then I'm gonna move to another topic? Pretty much that, yeah. Um mm -hmm. I think the chapter on Susan the Banshees is the longest single entry in, in the book. Um I I think that's right, but uh, it's certainly one of the longest, and rightly so, because um Robert was a member of them twice. Um 
I'm I'm a big fan of Susie Sue. I, I've I've interviewed her and I've, I've I've been a fan ever since I first got into the whole the whole gothic thing. And she's another one who would hate to be defined by that word. Um, but to answer your question about how did I know when to stop, that was a real problem because you've kind of touched upon the the interactive nature of the book that the fact mm -hmm. that you you can follow the words in bold almost like hyperlinks there's sort of, yeah, sort of exactly. like an analog version of hyperlinks um to to other entries and the book functions as a kind of warren of rabbit holes really mm. um and and you, you you can follow all kinds of different journeys through it but that's how it was to to research the book and it was one of those things where the more i tried to find out about the cure the more I realized there was still to find out. And it, it was like zooming in on a on an object with a microscope and finding that it's this incredibly complex structure that you weren't really aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, I, I found that some of the more tenuous and tangential and uh, obscure um, things that, that I was writing about seemed to be the best stuff. You know, I... I I was writing about, for example, um, uh, a, a, a small beach on on the Orkney Islands, which uh, lent its name to, um, to to a, a Cure instrumental track. And I suppose people might say, well, all you had to do was say that the song's named after that. But no, I wanted to find out kind of what's what's special about that place? What are the folk tales behind it? And all, all that kind of thing. Um, it was the same with uh, all sorts of topics like the, the Song of Forest. That's the first ent entry in the book. And I had to find out why do we feel the way we do as humans about forests, particularly in, in the Western imagination, that, that there's so much in terms of folk tales and literature um, and even film and TV about the the sort of the, the the fear and the mystery of of forests and uh when we listen to a forest by the cure all of that cultural memory plays into how it makes us feel so um uh, yeah that, I, I was having so much fun just writing about that stuff that's how i love to write about pop in general it you know it's it's the stuff around the edges because to me pop doesn't exist in a vacuum it's part of the broader culture. It is influenced by and in turn influences everything that goes on in, in, in culture. And that to me is, is why it's, it's, it's the ultimate art form. Pop to me is the ultimate art form because it encompasses everything else. Obviously there's music, but there's, there's, uh, there's film with the videos, there's, there's art with the record sleeves, there's poetry with the lyrics. There's, you know, if, even the, fashion the, the way people present themselves all of it it's it's just this it, it swallows everything up it, it's a, acting yeah uh, yes absolutely yeah yeah um all of that so um i think it's disingenuous when people who write about music say oh well i just care about music well then you're missing the point i think so mm -hmm. the the cure are, are a very easy band to write about in the way that i like to write um mm -hmm. because of that because there's so much going on mm -hmm. And you presumably have interviewed um, Robert Smith. Mentor? Actually, no. Can I surprise you? No. Yeah. Um, I've, I've interviewed Susie Sue. I've interviewed Lowell Tolhurst, but and various other. You know, I've spoken to various people who are associated with the Cure and people who crop up in the book. Not Robert, uh, which is one reason why um, you get quoted in the book because you have. Um, no, it, it wasn't that book. It, it's not. It's not an official book. It's not something mm. where I've I've sat down with the artist and let them, you know, present their narrative. I've the the task I set myself, and this is partly why it took so bloody long to write, was to try and trawl through the entire world's knowledge about the cure. So reading every article I could find. Um, listening to every old radio clip, watching every old TV interview that, that I possibly could to, to see what they were saying at the time, to see what, what their explanation was for each record as it happened, rather than a kind of, you know, 40 years on mm -hmm. retrospective 
um, look at it. So yeah, um, I, I, they, their voices do come through in the book, but it's their voices from then rather than from now. Mm. Um, well, just to to go into um, when I interviewed Robert Smith, um, and I, w- I would never have particularly said I was a Cure fan, but when you look back, you know the songs. I mean, I remember when singles came out, I had a view about them, whether or not I was writing about music at the time. Um, they've kind of seeped into the culture. But I was going to um, meet him because of the film Career Girls. Uh so I think I, I think I might have reviewed it. I think I reviewed. I think I interviewed the actresses, maybe for something else. But I, I did this interview with Robert Smith, and what was very interesting to me was that, and you'll know this as a journalist, like oh, I'm just going to interview somebody, and you say to people who it is, and some people go, oh, that sounds interesting, and some people go, oh my god, oh my god, and young women in the office were just like you know they were just beside themselves yeah and I thought well what is this kind of rather portly guy with you know badly applied makeup and big hair um you know he means something to me but what does he mean to people women who are 10 years younger who would have been like young teenagers um and I discovered that yeah there was a sort of almost a cult of Robert Smith for sort of young young women who now might be, I don't know, they might be saying that they were they were non-binary or something. Do you know what I mean? He was tapping into something that he wasn't a sexual figure. He wasn't. Well, that's um, interesting. They didn't um, rush after him, but they identified him with him in a in a very intense way. Uh, there's uh, a section in the book. Uh, C is for cuteness um, because I I do sort of present the argument that to a lot of women they don't see him as a sexual figure rather they they want to mother him because there's something very childlike about the way he dresses the way he moves uh, if, if we're talking about the sort of classic 80s era Robert Smith um, mm. that women find very appealing very adorable uh, well not not everybody but you know a, a lot of people do um obviously there'll be plenty of people who would be um horrified at me saying this and saying no i find him immensely sexually attractive um but um i yeah i i, I think um he he knows what he's doing when, when he's singing about kittens and sort of putting his fingers in his mouth and wearing oversized jumpers and all that kind of stuff it, it is there's there, there are so many signifiers of, of cuteness in there so that's part of it that he's kind of sexually unthreatening i suppose mm-hmm. but also i that's on a sort of superficial level but i think in, in his lyrics he does write in a way that's very empathetic towards women and he writes from a female point of view quite often and mm-hmm. People do notice this stuff, you know. It, it doesn't it doesn't pass people by. Um, so, I, I think that that's something that's always been appreciated. And the fact that he's showing a different way of being male. Um, he's not stereotypical kind of macho man. Um, and that that's something that I certainly valued greatly um, as as a teenager. That people like Robert Smith were showing a different way of being a man. Mm. Um, you know, where, where I grew up, you were supposed to um, play rugby, eat meat, drink 20 pints, have a fight, you know, all that kind of stuff, um, which is hugely oppressive and, and completely went against my own sensibilities. So I needed people like Robert Smith to kind of show me a, a different way of being. And and um, I, I remember there was an amazing interview well it was actually a sort of diary feature that that he wrote in flexipop magazine in about 82 which was just about a week in in his life and the things that he and his partner mary were doing um just blew my mind it it was really simple things like they would go out in the garden in the middle of the night and stage a ballet or 
he he would walk through the local park in a thunderstorm because he enjoyed being scared and he enjoyed the feeling that somebody might jump out at him um or um his mother went away and he would dress up as 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 his mother and cook the dinner and all these sorts sorts of things and it 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 sounds really kind of lightweight stuff now but at at the time i thought this is a grown up who is behaving in a way that i didn't know grown ups were allowed to to behave and i i tore that page out and folded it up and put it in my blazer pocket and took it to school every day cuz it inspired me and this was before i was really into their music it was it, it was the idea of him as a person it is something that really struck me before i became a massive fan of of, of the cures records um obviously i'm 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 not a girl um but um i think a lot of girl fans did also perceive something similar in that he he's he's not he's not like other guys um and yeah i i i don't know i i think um there's something quite open and warm and welcoming about his persona which you don't get from more stereotypically masculine rock stars. Mm. There was one, he was very charming in person to meet um, in a hotel suite in London. Um, I think he was drinking orange juice, or was it orange juice? Um, but he he had a, an anecdote, I can't remember whether it made it into the final piece, about what he liked to do. He liked going to kind of, fairs fun fairs and craft fairs and things um and he went to one with mary and there was a potter's wheel and yeah. he he queued and queued and queued and then went on the potter's wheel and then they couldn't kind of get him off the potter's wheel he enjoyed <laughs> it so much and he said he could hear little kids going you know when's that man going to stop <laughs> <laughs> and that's the that's the childlike thing i mean he really you know, he still had it in 97, put it that way. He still had this this child. And then the other thing I remember, which I thought was brilliant, there was so much you could put in, but I said, you know, you must have fans meeting you in the streets, you know, what's meeting f fans like? And he said in a very disgruntled tone, people burst into tears a lot. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> he said it with this sort of air of real puzzlement you know what's that about <laughs> yeah i wonder if he would still think that or if, if he now understands but it's nice that he was a bit bemused by, <laughs> by yeah. the reaction to him but yeah I, I i completely get get that he he means so much to people mm. i mean even you know the book you held it up before it's got a silhouette of him on the cover i i think he's one of the few pop stars or rock stars who you can um recognize just by their outline and mm -hmm. he you know the the word iconic is horrifically overused now but i i really think robert smith qualifies as an icon in the sense that just an image of his face just exudes so much meaning mm -hmm. to, to to a lot of people um and that that's you know pretty much the definition of a religious icon so mm. he he is that to people and then when he's just a normal guy walking down the street and people start crying <laughs> i mean it, it it does add up but i can see how it must be a lot for him to deal with sometimes there there, there were um there, there was one interview where that, that i read where, where he was talking about trying to go around in disguise um at, at, at the height of his fame and uh you know he he would try things like wearing dark glasses and putting a hat on um and uh, people would still recognize him and he said how how did you recognize me and he said uh, they they said it's your shoes and that that was cuz even his shoes are iconic those big mm -hmm. puffy white trainers that that he used, high top trainers that he used to wear so again there's a whole chapter in the book just about his shoes which kind of sounds sounds trivial but sometimes by looking at these really really kind of silly superficial topics you 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 can get to some kind of understanding uh, of of the artist i think there was actually a poster for the cure playing the uh, the Roskilde festival in uh, denmark 
which didn't even have a picture of Robert's face or even his silhouette. It had a picture of his shoes. Because anybody looking at that poster, oh, it's the cure, you know. Um, there aren't any pictures in the book. I just wanted to sort of, I think this is rather marvellous. That's the, yeah. um, well, I don't know what, I don't know what you call that. Is it the end papers? Possibly? The end papers, yeah. Um, they were done by um, Andy Vella, who is the Cure's own um, long-standing uh, record sleeve designer. Um, he, along with um, Paul Thompson, uh, who is now known as Pearl Thompson, by the way, um, uh, designed the majority of of the Cure's classic record sleeves. So to get him on board was was a real a real coup for us. Um, in the standard edition, uh, the, the one that, that you have there, uh, yeah, he's just done the letters C, U, R, and E. But in the deluxe edition, uh, he's done every letter of the alphabet and and. Uh, uh, and the box that the book comes in and there are prints that, you know, that, that come free with it and, and all of that. So, yeah, it was, it was great to get him on board. And, and it just gives the book a kind of a sort of cure look. Mm. It's, it, you know, it, it's it's not, as I say, I, uh, I really want to emphasise, it's not the official book. But it, it's it got an aura of cureness about it, which, thanks to Andy, which, which I like. And uh, no, no pictures whatsoever. No album sleeves or anything no, like that. It's, it, it's an encyclopedia, you know. It's right. uh, you know, it's it's in a sort of dictionary format. So um, yeah, uh, there there have been plenty of cure books with uh, endless photos. Um, in fact, Andy Vella did his own, and there's one by Tom Sheehan, the great rock photographer. Mm. Um, I I wasn't aiming to to compete with those, and I'm sure most fans already have at least one of those 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 books so um yeah th this is all about um kind of facts on the one hand and sort of theories and analysis on the other um so yeah it's it's long enough as it is it's uh, <laughs> it's it's yeah. uh it's it's half the length of the bible and one third the length of the works of shakespeare so that's that's plenty to be getting along with i think yeah <laughs> um were you keen to bust any myths about the cure as you as you went along, and and did you in fact bust any myths? There are a few things where their own version of events doesn't stack up. So, for example, um, they were accused of ripping off New Order's Blue Monday on their own single, "The Walk," and they they have claimed in the past that they couldn't possibly have done so because because um, of, of, of the sort of dates of release and, and dates of recording. I looked into that and yeah, they absolutely had had enough time to, to listen to what New Order were up to. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that means it's plagiarism. It, it could just be coincidental. And they are both fantastic records. So I'm glad they, they're both out there in the world. But, but little things like that, yeah. Um, I, I ended up getting very nerdy about stuff like that, which which I, I sort of think is what Cure fans want. I think Cure fans are, well, not all of them, but a, a lot of Cure fans are very obsessive, and um, they they will always know know more than more than I do. But um, I I just hope that they've found it entertaining to see things chopped up in this kind of alphabetical format, mm. which allowed me to write thematically and to sort of piece things together in a way that possibly hadn't been done before so for example there's a recurring theme in robert's lyrics of drowning there, there are so many cure songs about dying in the sea and drowning and stuff like that and and i, I just wanted to sort of gather them all together and 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 come up with ideas about why that might be um and yeah things like alcohol all all the incidents involving that uh all the instances of of literature influencing their work and and stuff like that just just to kind of draw things together from different eras which you couldn't really do with a straightforward chronological uh, biography so on the one hand the the a to z format could look a bit gimmicky um and when the idea was first put to me of doing it I thought well maybe this is a bit gimmicky um but the more I thought about it I thought this actually liberates me and it does give me the freedom to 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 write it in a more thematic way and and I had a lot of fun with that
You find um, in this sort of way of making your own way through the book, there's all sorts of nuggets to be found along the way. So I was fascinated to see that there was, in fact, a little bit of a touching of the worlds of Joy Division and The Cure. Yeah. Um, and obviously Joy Division, it was such a brief period of time that they were around. The Cure has gone on and on and on and on. Um, and just to think that, yeah, they were coming up at the same time. There were there were almost things in common that they had. It's a very interesting idea to me. I would never have thought. I mean, they, you know, um, shared a stage at one point, you know. Yeah, they shared a stage. And um, Robert has said at various times that Joy Division are his, his favourite band. He's also said that New Order are. Um, but there's also an intense... Well, sometimes intense rivalry between between mm. the Cure and Joy Division slash New Order, um, and I, I go into that in in the book quite a lot. Um, I think Joy Division maybe get taken more seriously than the Cure, um, and I think that's highly unfair. And some of it is down to this really reductive, banal idea that just because the lead singer killed himself. That means that oh he really meant it that that his his angst was somehow that much more intense and real. I don't I don't look at it that way. Um, I think Ian's death was a a personal tragedy for everyone involved, but it doesn't retrospectively put some kind of stamp of authenticity mm -hmm. on on his work. But people do do look at things in that really really basic way and and the fact that robert smith is still with us and still performing um you know some people won't forgive him for that uh mm -hmm. i think he, he he said said something to, to that effect once um but yeah I, I i i do think the cures early work um on albums like faith and pornography should be taken as seriously in terms of um the development of if you want to call it gothic rock, but alternative rock, as anything Joy Division did. Absolutely. Um, so I, I don't I don't want to sort of exhaustively pull out everything in the book, and it actually would be very difficult to do so. Um, we'd be here for hours and hours and hours. Um, but I just wanted to um, mention again Lowell Tolhurst. Yeah. A huge part of the story. Um, and... You know, you can almost not find an entry in which he doesn't sort of pop up or or signify something. Um, but but that's quite controversial, isn't it? The um, Lol Tolhurst within the group um, has caused a bit of controversy or or strife. Yeah, um, I guess for people who don't know, um, Lol was a founder member of the Cure. In mm. fact, he was a member of all the kind of pre-Cure bands when they were teenagers as well, um, and was with them until sort of eighty nine, ninety, the disintegration era, is when he got edged out or you know unceremoniously booted out of, of the band because he was suffering with alcoholism and um, probably um, the last two albums when he was a member of the Cure, he didn't really contribute that much as a result of that and um they said a lot of very harsh and unkind things about him and you can kind of understand why they would have done that because they were deeply frustrated with his with his conduct towards the end of his time in, in the band but he was he was an addict he he was he was suffering well i suppose we should say he is an addict because you because you you never you're never fully fully sort of cured of that um I found that the more I, I researched Lol Tolhurst, the, the more impressed I was by him. And, and I started to think that rather than this kind of clownish figure that, that, that he was he was seen as by a lot of people towards the end, I, I started thinking that he was, you know, a, a significant uh, contributor to what The Cure were about, uh, particularly in their early days. And I was also impressed by... Um, just from reading his his own um, autobiography, Cured, um, the way in which he's kind of owned, he's he's owned his mistakes and he's done his best to make amends, and he, he's got a, a really sort of um, dignified perspective, I, I would say, on on his past mistakes, 
and and I think it's all kind of water under the bridge now. He he was uh, invited to to rejoin the Cure um, to to play a series of gigs where where they they played the early albums. So you know they they kind of patched things up, and that that was that was lovely to see. Mm. Do you think you would like to now that you've you've got the A to Z done and dusted? Do you think you would like to meet or interview Robert Smith, um, or is yeah. it a case of be wary about meeting your heroes? Oh, I've met plenty of my heroes, and, and usually they're fantastic. So, um, yeah, I'd I'd love to interview Robert Smith. Um, uh, everywhere I've worked there have been people higher up the pecking order than me. When I was at Melody Maker, there were other writers who, who were, you know, just more important than me and higher up the food chain. And they, they got to do it. Um, the same at the independent. I nearly interviewed him at the independent actually, but it kind of fell through. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. He's, he's such, such an interesting, interesting figure. And uh, I have, having spent three years almost of my life trying to figure him out for this book, <laughs> it would be kind of, both weird and interesting to to sort of uh actually um try and un unpick his thoughts face to face i don't know i don't think i was above you in the pecking order but i think i was on the staff so <laughs> ah well there we go that, that <laughs> don't like to give it. work to yeah, people yeah. on the staff you know because of the oh, i was 97 pay. though i wasn't there yet so there we go oh yeah, right was was my time. Oh, okay yeah. um well i obviously jumped over somebody else um <laughs> to uh to get the great interview so i mean who who um in terms of other heroes have you interviewed well um stevie nicks my favorite female singer Smokey robinson my favorite male singer so um uh, yeah mm. that these these figures to me that almost seem like superheroes it's, it's almost ridiculous that they exist as kind of flesh and blood um but 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 to me Smokey and stevie were two of the real high points. Um, Chuck D from Public Enemy, um, one of the most impressive people I've ever met, um, probably along with Richie from the Mannix, the most intelligent interviewee I've, I've ever faced. Um, mm -hmm. The one that got away was Prince, sadly, who is, for me, the greatest of all time, um, the greatest musical genius of the 20th century, um, I, I would say. Um, I was all lined up to fly out to Minneapolis to interview him. Um, I'd got my passport um, renewed super fast just to go and do that trip. And then uh, just before I could go and do it, he died. <gasps> yeah. Oh, so, really uh, yeah. Gut wrenching, but all the more so for you. You must have been gutted. I was gutted. But you know what? Um, yeah, they they do say don't meet your heroes, and I've got friends who who have met Prince and interviewed him, and yeah, he was a obviously a tricky character, and I might not have had the wonderful experience that I dreamt of. You know, I, he he wouldn't even allow people to to record the conversation, and uh, mm. I don't know, wouldn't even allow pencils in the room or something like that. So, so um, yeah, maybe maybe it's for the best that that he can remain this kind of superhero figure to me <laughs> mm. so did you meet um richie richie manic mm. yeah i mean i i got to know him pretty well uh i i was basically between 91 and uh i don't know i suppose 97 when i left the melody maker I was the go-to guy for writing about the manics if, if there was mm. a feature to be written about them i i would usually do it mm. and um yeah, I was following them very closely the the, the whole time, and, and and got to know got to know Richie um, as well as any journalist would be allowed to put it that way. I'm not going to say I, I I knew him as well as his real life friends and family, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, in in terms of being being a a, a member of of the press, I, I felt that I was granted um, better access than than most, and 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 got to know him. Yeah. Mm, because there's the um, the the really terrible thing. I mean, one of the most shocking things was when he carved into his his own arm. Um, and and it's sort of what we've been talking about: whether you get kudos for being for real. As uh, he, um... yeah, well, he is another one of those guys. He's one of those, along with Kurt Cobain and Ian Curtis, mm. 
Um, it is now assumed legally that Richie is dead, even though, you know, nobody was ever found. So, um, in it, you know, um, he, he is essentially another one of those dead icons like mm -hmm. Kurt and like Ian Curtis. Um, and there are some people who um, are drawn to that uh, and, and believe that that somehow makes their work um, more, more valid. Um, I, I don't buy that. I wish he was still here. Mm. Um, I think he had so much left to, to, to offer. Um, it's deeply sad um, that, that uh, he didn't feel unable to carry on um, whether as um, a sort of public figure or just as a, a person in the world. And I, I miss him. I miss him greatly. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and writing writing the book, um, my Manix book was was pretty hard because of that. It was all still quite raw. I started writing the book in '97, uh, and he'd only gone missing two years earlier. Mm. So um, yeah, it it was pretty tough to sort of have to put myself in the headspace of this guy who was obviously deeply troubled and who who I knew personally. Um, yeah, it was it was it was it was very hard, but um, I don't know. I I tried to capture him as best I could. Mm. Yeah, it's an absolutely wonderful book. Um, Thank you. And it's not you know it's not just about that. It's all about you know the joy of the music and guys getting together and all the ideas that they had. Um, so it's all yeah. ultimately a very affirming book. I think uh, it's it, is it called everything it's called everything a book, a book about manic about street preachers um it. there's a very battered copy there <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, you, you can still get them on ebay or whatever uh, yeah that's the edition books. i have with a with yeah, a pink yeah. picture of you on the back yeah looking very winsome <laughs> <laughs> and when you when you turn your head like that we can see the horns yes um which you've always been famous for having having the horns you, you yeah yeah People who read my work in the Independent uh, will have seen just yeah this bit because um, exactly. we yeah we had we had photos at the top of our columns didn't we um, yeah. and, until they unceremoniously got rid of us all sacked yeah. all the arts staff because hey who wants to read art critics anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was fun while it lasted <laughs> well you were you were famous for for the horns go on tell us the hor the horns anecdote oh, which I always well, love yeah I mean I I, I had. I've, I've had every stupid hairstyle you can have because I, you know, I looked at my dad who went bald quite young and thought, well, this is probably going to happen to me. I'm going to make the most of my hair while I still could. I used to have the, the massive gothic mane, the sort of Robert Smith type hairstyle. Um, but um, yeah, the, the, I, I actually shaved my head for a while because I thought, well, you know, obviously I, I can't do anything with it anymore. But I got really bored and thought, well, that's not me. That's, that's you know... I, and I thought, what what are my options here? And really, the only options were to grow horns. Everyone thinks I nicked it from Keith from the Prodigy, but actually, the predecessor um, was Sue Catwoman, um, oh, punk icon, right. in the seventies. Um, but um, yeah, what what used to happen? What and I think this is what you're talking about. Um, I'm fairly tall, and I uh, often used to wear. Um, stack heel platform heeled boots, mm -hmm. um, the sort of glam rock image. Um, and I had these horns on top as well. And it meant that I was a very useful landmark. And people at festivals would say, Oh, um, right, I'm just off to get a drink. I'll meet you by Simon Price at three o'clock <laughs> 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 because I was so visible in the crowd. And um, I, I would be aware of people sort of lurking around me. And I thought, They're, they're using me like, like Nelson's <laughs> column or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> brilliant <laughs> yeah it's certainly i mean there's something to be said for being one of the more visible journalists of your of your generation i think yeah um i mean uh, when i was at leeds at one point i had very brightly colored hair i had kind of stripes and crazy color and all that kind of thing yeah um, and it meant that you're very famous on campus without knowing that you are. So yeah. people just sort of smile and said hello the whole time because it was like that's that that's that student with 
stupid stripy hair, you know. So yeah, people well, just is, um... start conversations with me. I don't think they ever met, you know, used me as a meeting point. I'm probably not tall <laughs> enough, but but yeah. it is quite funny that thing of you're just pootling along being yourself and and you seem to be creating a, a sort of wave yeah. of interest in people around you. Anyway, I, I stopped having stripy hair. <laughs> I suppose in some ways that's what appealed to me about the goth look in the 80s, because I am quite shy and um, it was a way of making people notice me without having to actually speak. So, and also it, it's a look which kind of sends out two contradictory messages. It says, notice me, but keep your distance. Mm. Um, people don't always hear the second part, though, you know, so people <laughs> do tend to amble over to me to offer me some bants about how I'm looking. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, it's, it's too um, late to turn back now. <laughs> let's um, let's move on to the final three questions. Yeah. yeah. I have provided you with in advance. So mm. favourite artwork, please, Simon. Well, um, I don't know if this is cheating, but I've chosen a book which is pretty much entirely the artwork. It's Rock Dreams by Nick Cohn and Guy Pillout, um, the uh, the artist who did things like um, David Bowie's Diamond Dogs, for example. Oh, but right. um, his style, it, he uses airbrush, but he depicts rock stars as these kind of hyper real um superhuman figures and um the text each each photo so here's so just open it for example is a picture of johnny ray here and mm -hmm. uh, underneath there's a little bit of text from um the great writer nick Cohn, who wrote a what Bop -a -bop -a lot bam boom mm -hmm. um the first proper history of rock and roll um and uh it just kind of um gives a kind of mythical edge to, to these rock stars um there's a picture which i'm i, I don't think i'm going to show you but it de <laughs> it depicts the rolling stones as nazi pedophiles which obviously hugely controversial but um they're always looking um P pilat and cone for some angle on 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 a group that that sheds light so here's here's another picture of the stones as a kind of song and dance cowboy um pirate act mm. and, and it's just a fantastic book it's one of these books that if i ever see it in a secondhand shop um i i'll just buy a copy so i can give it to someone else all right here's one of my favorites it's diana ross in the back of a limo and yeah you know wearing you know a fur stole and loads of jewelry and she's driving back through the ghetto and looking nervously out of the window <laughs> seeing these these homeless guys basically you know where she came from essentially and looking with this kind of fear that she could sort of fall back there um mm. and yeah just I, I don't know it's 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 a really really glorious book and and uh I would urge anyone if, if they can find a copy to to get hold of it is it is it quite old? Did it come out quite a few years ago? Yeah, um, I think it was sort of mid mid seventies um, oh, that, right. that it came out. So, but it's been republished many times. Um, right. So, yeah, Rock Dreams by uh, Nick Cohn and Guy Pellet. That's that's my my cheating answer for the artwork. Yeah. No, that's absolutely fine. We've had yeah. we've had album covers, we've had posters, we've had all sorts of things. Uh, everything is allowed here on Book Bag. Okay. I mean, just feel free. Yeah. Uh, I I don't think I'd allow Nazi pedophiles, but that you know. No, that's... and yeah, I I wonder, I wonder if mind you, the the Rolling Stones can't have minded that much because they did employ Guy Pellout to to um, to do one of their record sleeves not long after that. So uh, they obviously held no grudge. But there we go. Right. Uh, okay, my second question. I keep forgetting the second question. Oh yes, it's it's the book. That everyone would have expected Simon Price to have read by now, but he kind of hasn't. Do you have such a thing, a book of shame? Yeah, um, don't tell anyone, but <laughs> um, a, a lot of the um, the, the literary stuff in Cuopedia, I, I didn't have time to read mm. Mervyn Peake's Gormenghast trilogy, for example. I, I that, that would have put the book back another year, I think. Yeah. 
<laughs> so um a, a lot of the stuff yeah so i i, I haven't read mervyn peak uh, i've i've found the relevant passages that uh, influenced the cure but um but no i so i i, I had to basically go on kind of bluffers guides um and you know uh, received wisdom sort of secondhand wisdom about some of those books however um i can honestly say that I wrote my university dissertation about um, the Outsider by Camus, so I was on much much more solid oh, ground when I was uh, talking right. about the influence of Camus on the Cure. Put it that way. Well, the thing about um, the Peak books is, I think I think it's only the first two. The last one is a bit of a disappointment, uh, uh, but, but like the Godfather. That, they're quite big. They, you know, they are completely brilliant, but. Um, mm. There'll be a, you know, they'll, you can read those later on sometime. Um, finally, what yeah. is the most bizarre, weird, or funny feedback that you've ever had on your on your work, your books, or maybe your journalism? I mean, you, you know, as we know, um, you can get some quite funny kind of green ink letters. Uh, there isn't really a green ink equivalent to email, but. Um, you know, sometimes things that you, you've written can spur a strange response. But anyway, what did you what did you come up with? Well, because I'm quite recognisable, I used to get backlash from artists quite often. Ah. So, um, for example, um, I wrote a review of a band called The Dillons, whose artwork always had lemons on it, and they were pretty terrible. And uh, I, I wrote a review that they considered very bitter. You can see where this is going. I turned up in the office one day. There were nine crates of lemons there sent for me by by um, by the Dillons. Um, <laughs> Pop, Pop itself um, sent somebody over to pour a pint over my head. I hope it was beer, but I'm not entirely sure. Who, who did that? Um, Sorry, I didn't catch Pop that. itself. Pop oh. itself did that. Um, I actually quite like them, but I obviously must have slagged them off or annoyed them somehow. Mm. Um, but my favourite one, um, it was the Wonder Stuff, Miles Hunt. Um, I had to review um, the Wonder Stuff's greatest hits for Melody Maker in the mid-90s. Um, and I prefaced the review by saying that back in the late 80s, um, when I was younger and more foolish, I had been a bit of a fan of The Wonder Stuff. And I worked out that I'd probably spent about 35 quid, which was a fair bit of money in those days, on Wonder Stuff t-shirts, gig tickets, albums, and so on. Um, and I was saying that just to say that, you know, that gives me the right to say what I'm about to say. And then I sort of just basically took apart their, their entire canon of, of work. Um, and um, about a week later, an envelope turns up at Melody Maker offices. I open it and it's a check uh, for £35 from the account of M Hunt. That's and I thought that was really funny and a very classy touch. I had a real admiration uh, for him for doing that that's and, uh, very yeah, good that was very witty and um there were times when as a freelance <laughs> journalist i was so skinned i thought about cashing it but <laughs> never quite never quite was reduced to that oh right so you've still you've still got it have you yeah you have still got it what, what a lovely little memento i think i've got yeah. a check i'm pretty sure i've got a check somewhere signed by auburn war yeah. um and it was when i started writing some I've written something for the literary review and it seemed better to just have a signature of Auburn War than the tiny amount of money whatever it was that they were they were paying um, I think a lot of I, people have done that Salvador Dali just used to sort of you know sign Dali on a on a tablecloth and and that that was that would pay for his meal and uh, yeah, yeah get a free <laughs> meal I remember once I was writing a column at the, the um independent on Sunday and I mean, actually, it was quite a nice letter, but it was somebody who prefaced the niceness of the letter going, you know, I once read a column by Susie Fay and it was so full of disgusting swear words. I vowed I would never read her again. And then I read this one and I liked it. So um, so it was kind of weird because I couldn't figure out what I could possibly, you know, I'm not really known for my, you know, my wild obscenities or at least I didn't 
think I was. So oh, um, yeah, that that Some always people can be very touchy thing. about that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I miss the days when you, you had a really good class of um, of person where you know they had to get a stamp and get an envelope and and yeah. write on a piece of paper and. As I've said before many times, I was the letters editor of Time Out. Best job ever. But people had to rise to a certain standard, you know, like mm. make a bit of effort and get the address right. You know, letters editor. Exactly. We are too well connected to each yeah. other in the world now. You know, it's funny, as a writer, you spend the first half of your life trying to make some sort of connection with the world, and then you want the world to leave you alone. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant um, talking to you, Simon. Uh, I hope our paths cross at some stage in the Thank future. Thank you very much for having me. I'll look you up if I'm ever down in Brighton. Yeah, please do. Um, but yeah, horns and all. Uh, thank you so much for joining me in the book bag. We have been yeah. talking about picks up giant tome once more. Curepedia A to Z of the cure. Um, it is about the cure, and it's about far more than the cure. So uh, check it out. And thank you very much for joining me in the book bag. Thank you, Susie. I will bid you adieu. And uh, thank you very much for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed our wander through all matters curious. Uh, join me next time when I shall find another brilliant author to interview. Thanks for watching. <laughs>